Hello, welcome to this video where we look at triple integrals in Cartesian coordinates. My name is Nikai Rimmer, and I'm helping you through this multivariable calculus journey. We're on to triple integrals. We've just finished double integrals, and now we want to see how we can use triple integrals and what do they measure. So first off, I want you to know that we're going to have three different coordinate systems. Uh, in this video, uh, this represents the first in a series of videos. I make my videos somewhere near 10 minutes so that you can um, sort of chop up a, a whole lecture. I don't want you to sit for 50 minutes and watch the video. And so I, um, I chop these videos up into pieces. Uh, so this particular video looks at triple integrals in Cartesian, just an introduction. We'll get deeper into what's going on behind the scenes in the next video. But yes, Cartesian coordinates, right? We have X, Y, and now we have Z. We already know about that. We've started 3D. Um, we started looking at 3D um, functions. We started looking at the calculus behind 3D functions. We, we understand that, yes, now points have coordinates X, Y, and Z. We looked at double integrals, and we saw that when we have a double integral, it measures the volume under a surface and above a, a region in the X, Y plane. So what is a triple integral measure? If we, if we take a function now has three input values and then one output value, that's actually four dimensions. We lose our ability to be able to visualize what it is we're measuring. We can call it 4D volume if we want, but we can't see a good picture of it and be able to understand what's, go what's really going on. But when the function on the inside is a one, we actually are able to get an understanding of what we are measuring. The issue that comes in, in triple integrals in Cartesian is the fact that when you had dy dx or dx dy, there were only those two orders. That was it. Well, with the introduction of a third variable as the possible input variable, then now that changes things. And we don't have just two orders anymore. There are six different orders. We have three options for the first variable that we're going to integrate with respect to, two options for the second variable that we're going to integrate with respect to, and then the last variable be determined. That's six different options. And so here's one particular order, dz, dy, dx. But any rearrangement of that is a different order. So that brings in complications. Uh, when the integrand is a one, we saw in double integrals, when the integrand was a one, you're actually measuring area of a two-dimensional shape. So in triple integrals, when the integrand is a one, you're measuring volume. And so um, in double integrals, we had the, the symbol dA to represent a piece of area. Now in triple integrals, we have the symbol dV to represent a, a piece of a three-dimensional volume. So we're integrating over three-dimensional regions. And we have to be familiar with such regions. Um, and we have to be able to make our way through such integrals. We know how to do the, the antiderivatives by holding the other variable constant. We've looked at that from double integrals, but now we just we just got to figure out how to figure how to know what the order should be. Um, sometimes you'll be given a question, it's very rare, but sometimes you'll be given a question and the order is determined for you. Here's this first example. So the order is determined for you. DZ, DX, DY. There's nothing to stop you as far as the integrand goes about how you're going to find the antiderivative in that order. And then the actual three-dimensional region that you're integrating over, we could get a picture of it. But um, basically, this is just a straightforward, can you execute the, it's called an iterated integral when you have um, these integrals after integrals after integrals. That's an iteration of integrals. Um, can you execute this? Can you integrate with respect to Z first? If your function inside has no z's in it, then that's considered a constant. I know it's cosine. I know it's x and y on top of y, but, but it is a constant with respect to z. And so you just get this constant times z, and then you put the two different values of z, the upper bound on z and the lower bound on z. So you're just going to go ahead and plug a y in and plug a 0 in. So now you're looking at a double integral. You devolve from a triple integral down into a double integral. So your ability or inability to be able to calculate a double integral is now going to play a role. The particular order that this is given in is dx dy. So we're integrating with respect to x first. 
That's good because we could not integrate with respect to y first. We don't have what we need to be able to find the antiderivative with the y being in the denominator like that. But the antiderivative of cosine of x over y, we can find that. It's like integrating cosine of x over 7. We know how to find that antiderivative. We treat the 1 over y as a constant and we divide by that reciprocal. So what happens is we let, if you want to, let's do a u sub. Let u equal 1 over y times x. Then du is 1 over y times dx. Or the fact that y du is going to take the place of dx. And so instead of looking at cosine of x over y, you're looking now at cosine of u. But there's an extra factor y in there. And so the antiderivative is y times the sine of u. All right, so what was u? u was x over y. We had the y from the first integration. It's in red. And now we have a y from the second integration. I have that in blue. Now x is going to be equal to y squared and x is going to be equal to zero. And so when we sub those in, upper limit minus lower limit, we end up with the following. Just the y squared gives you y squared on top of y. So that inside of sine is a y. So now we're integrating y squared times the sine of y. This is a single variable integral, but it's not a simple technique. The integral of the product is not the product of the integrals. You can't just take the antiderivative of y squared and the antiderivative of the sine of y. It just doesn't work that way. And so when you have a product like this, one technique that often works is integration by parts. And there are occasionally times when you can use a shortcut to integration by parts. And so we'll use this shortcut when you have a polynomial times an easily integrable function multiple times, that is, then you can do integration by part shortcut. What you do is you integrate the polynomial down to, uh, you differentiate the polynomial down to zero and you integrate the other term the same amount of times. This takes care of all the uv minus integral v du for you when we multiply diagonally and apply these signs alternating with plus minus plus and you keep going if you need to. The first part is uv and then there's minus the integral of v du and then this particular integral what we require integration by parts twice and so we have another uv another minus an integral of um, v du that double minus makes it plus that's why it alternates like that antiderivative of sine negative cosine antiderivative of negative cosine negative sine antiderivative of negative sine positive cosine and we if we were to keep going we could so we multiply and now we have our antiderivative in hand minus y squared cosine y plus 2y sine y plus 2 cosine y. We're done. Put a pi over 2 in, put a 0 in. A lot of this zeroes out. I mean, the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. That's there twice. The cosine y is in two of these terms. And then there's a 0 that you're plugging in for the lower limit on the, on the, uh, after, after evaluating the upper limit. So, you get zeros because of the fact that you have y squared and 2y out front, or minus y squared and 2y out front. Those parts zero out. So four of these terms zero out, two don't. The middle term from the upper limit, the sine of pi over 2 is a 1. 2 times pi over 2 is a pi. So that gives you a pi. And then the third term from the lower limit, 2 times the cosine of 0 is a 2. Final answer to this question, this three-dimensional region that we were integrating over, although we didn't have a good picture of it, we still were able to do it. We're calculating a fourth dimension volume and we're getting pi minus two. All right. And so the action is the same as, with the, as it was with the double integral. The issue is going to be the setup of it. In the next video, we'll dive into trying to figure out which variable to integrate with respect to first. Here, we had no issues. It was given to us and we're able, there was nothing to stop us from doing it in that order. So in the next video, we really have to tackle how to decide. Should you do Z first? Should you do Y first? Should you do X first? What does that even look like? What's the mechanics? What's the geometry behind it? And then how do you execute the integral in the end? My name is Nakai Rimmer again. Thank you for watching. If you need any extra resources, please find your way to my website, calcoach.com. Uh, please like and subscribe. Um, comment down below. Ask me any questions. Reach out to me if you need help. Uh, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. All right, bye-bye.